Well, hello everyone. So I'm Terence Doyle and um, I'm in the Department of Medicine at the University uh, in the hospital as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, this topic of the circulation and uh, William Harvey's revolutionary idea. Now, uh, everyone's aware of a pulse. Uh, it's all of great cultural significance, I'm sure. Um, but uh, everyone knows how to find the pulse uh, on themselves. Uh, everyone knows as well that your pulse races when you get upset or you're angry or there's some other emotion involved. Um, so the heartbeat is of great cultural significance, that's for sure. Well, around 1618, William Harvey decided that he would investigate the uh, nature of the heartbeat, and more particularly, he had the idea, the extraordinary idea at the time, that the heart uh, beat in a circulation of the blood. So, if you are going to investigate this problem in the early 1600s, how would you do it? When you could, this is an open heart surgery of a human, if you were going to do, use dissection, well, how would that go? Well, when you dissect things, you don't actually get any sense of function. So you couldn't work out the circularity of the movement of the blood just from dissection. What about vivisection doing on living animals? Well, the, the heart beats very, very quickly, particularly in small animals. And so it's very hard to work out just what's going on. Is the heart expanding or contracting? It's rising and falling. What is the heart rate? What is the opening volume? What is the closing volume? All very difficult. If you open the heart uh, to have a look inside, well, then the animal dies. And so that's not too, too much good. So it's all very difficult. Uh, and uh, you have to know uh, what you're looking for, really. But the problem with William Harvey was he didn't know what he was looking for exactly. Not only that, but the established wisdom at the time was quite wrong. So all his education had led him to believe something quite different. And what is the purpose of the circulation? That was another problem that Harvey had uh, that he had to work out as well. What's the relationship of the great vessels, the arteries and the veins? How do they communicate with each other? What about the flow rate of this proposed circulation? Now, if you take a water pipe at home and you puncture a hole in it, quite a lot of water will gush out. That doesn't tell you anything at all about the flow rate that was in the pipe to start with. It could have just been sitting there. But just, so puncturing a hole in an artery isn't by itself going to tell you anything, particularly about the uh, blood flow or the rate of flow. So Harvey had to work out all of this physiology and anatomy, not only by observation, but by using logic as well. And in fact, he's going to use the philosophical approach of Aristotle, and I'm going to be weaving Aristotle into the story, uh, hopefully not to your alarm. But let me just give you some background of, uh, of the situation, of the way in which the heart was viewed early on. So Aristotle um, functioned in, in, in Athens, he had um, an academy in Athens, well, when um, he fell foul of the other people in the academy, uh, he took himself off to the island of Lesbos, uh, and to the east of the Aegean, and started to do investigations on small animals. Uh, and he particularly looked at the egg, the chick embryo. And uh, using the chick embryo was used by Harvey and other workers as well, but uh, Aristotle in particular did, and so he noticed that when you took a fertilized egg and opened it up, the first thing that appears is blood, or at least red streaks, they appear first. And then the red streaks appear to pulsate. And then a bit later, a heart is formed. So Aristotle, not unreasonably, decided that the blood was the prime element of life. And then the heart was a pretty close second. But basically he said that the blood and the heart together were the essence of life. And he uh, put the brain and thinking function and the soul, if you will, in the heart and the blood. And in fact he wrote a, a book about that called Historia Animalium. And he also uh, originated the four humoral theory of medicine. The idea that the um, everything in... Uh, Creation is made up of air, earth, fire, and water. Uh, there are various qualities that he had, uh, Aristotelian qualities, hot, uh, cold, uh, wet, and dry. And then he uh, 
balance the human body according to the uh, uh, amount of each of these humors that were in the body. Not only was the heart the essence of life, but it was also a source of the body heat. Now, the heat of the body was a very important element of early Greek medicine. And uh, we can see that perpetuated in the uh, Catholic Church, uh, where, you know, you'll be familiar with these pictures of the Sacred Heart, the burning heart of Jesus, my heart burns for you, all that kind of stuff. Well, that's all, to do, that's all pure Aristotle. The Catholic Church hasn't moved out of the away from Aristotle since the Middle Ages. Uh, and the idea that, that the heart is uh, a furnace, a source of heat and life, is so very important. But the more important person for the history of medicine is Galen. And Galen flourished in the early Roman uh, period, uh, and uh, 130 to 200. Uh, he was a uh, physician to the gladiatorial school uh, in Pergamon and later in Rome and uh, he was very prolific and wrote on a great many things. Particularly, he pioneered the use of the pulse in diagnosis, and he wrote a book on it, De Pulsibus, here. Uh, and that's a very interesting book to read as well. And he was using the pulse to diagnose, uh, in this case here, which is a, a drawing, not done by him, but it's a, uh, <coughs> a 14th century drawing uh, from one of his texts, uh, where Galen here was called to diagnose the uh, racing pulse of this young woman who was the wife of Justus, who was a Roman nobleman. And he noticed that the pulse started to race when she laid eyes on this handsome young man, apparently with the really comely thighs, uh, and so he diagnosed Amantus Dignosio, so he uh, diagnosed love as the uh, cause of her problem. Uh, now, <coughs> Galen's theories... Uh, dominated medicine uh, for 1,500 years. And so I want to spend just a moment outlining Galen's theory of physiology because that is what Harvey had to overturn. So let's just focus on this uh, drawing here. Uh, Galen <coughs> had a complete uh, system of physiology which involved two separate blood systems, two completely separate blood systems. Here, a blue one and a red one. <coughs> Uh, the blue one was based on the liver, and basically liver made blood <coughs> from nutrients derived from the gut uh, and imbued the uh, blood with natural spirits, as they were called, and the blood ebbed slowly from the liver out to the periphery. That was one completely isolated circulation. There was another circulation based on the left ventricle, and the blood got into the left ventricle, a very small amount of it, through holes in the interventricular septum. These are very important to understand what was going on. So a very small amount of this blood from the blue system gets into here. And in the heart, the left ventricle, uh, it's heated and imbued with vital spirits, which are essence, uh, essential to life. And these vital spirits then ebb out to the periphery as well. Some of them go up to the brain to be turned into animal spirits, which then flow out through the nerves to provide sensation and motor function. Uh, <clears throat> but a small amount of the nutrient blood from blue goes into the lungs to, to uh, feed the lungs, uh, and a very small amount of blood goes from the left ventricle back to the lungs also, but carrying waste gases. Very curious concept. But the uh, other function of this vessel going from the lung to the left ventricle is to take air from the lung into the heart. And so the uh, blood on the left side, the uh, one with the vital spirits, has been imbued with air. In, Greeks they, in Greek they called it the pneuma, which is sort of a life force. You could almost substitute the word oxygen for pneuma and you'd be pretty right. And this mixture of air, or pneuma, with the blood was what was in the arteries. And <clears throat> this accounted for the fact that when you opened an artery in a cadaver, there was very little, if any, blood there, only a very small amount of blood, just air. Now, what about these holes in the wall? How did he decide on those? Well, first of all, it was necessary philosophically to complete a system. He had to have them. 
Uh, next, in fact, when you look at the interventricular septum, there are these funny bands, and they look like pits, uh, but uh, many people have tried to find these holes but couldn't find them because they don't exist. Uh, and also he knew that there was a, an, an opening from the right to the left side of the heart called the foramen ovale in the fetus. Of course, in the fetus, there is no pulmonary circulation because the, blood, the, the, the lungs don't function. And so this bypass circuit was known to Galen. So it all completed the system. So um, with that in mind, uh, he uh, laid out the system. So blood flows from the liver out to the periphery. Now the other part of the system is that the organs in the periphery attract blood to them. They attract nutrient. Nothing's pumped to them. They, it, it is attraction. And this idea of attraction of bodies to each other was very important in Greek philosophy and, and early medicine, really up until the Middle Ages. Now this uh, idea of Harvey's, where he closed the system off and made it a complete circuit, was completely contrary to accepted medical opinion in the early 1600s. And the uh, Galenic theory was held by very intelligent and very experienced uh, medical practitioners. So he was completely against the medical establishment with a totally revolutionary idea. Not only that, but it had great importance for body function. If you uh, ditched Galen's theory and took the circulation theory, you had to change your ideas about the function of nutrition, the function of respiration, the function of excretion in the kidneys. Everything had to be changed. Not only that, you would have to change your methods of treatment. The idea of bloodletting uh, as a cure to get rid of humours from various individual parts of the body, from the neck or the legs or wherever, to drain the evil humours from one particular body part made no sense at all if all everything was in, in motion constantly. So people had a vested interest in opposing uh, what Harvey was, was uh, suggesting. Not only that, but <clears throat> Harvey, uh, Galen's theory actually worked quite well in, in terms of Greek philosophy. It explains physiology quite well. So if you look at the liver, the liver in fact is a purplish colour. So it looks like congealed blood. And it's close to the stomach, so obviously it's the seat of nutrition. That's, uh, you know, when the designer put the whole thing together, Obviously, he or she put the liver right next to the, to, the, to the gut for that reason. So, there are two closed systems, and liver provides nutrition, and the lungs provide the vital spirits to vivify the blood. Well, that's not unreasonable either. He also knew that arterial blood looked different to venous blood. So, arterial blood here is bright red, because it's got oxygen in it, and uh, venous blood is dark. Well, why is that? Well, Galen said, well, it's obvious, because there are two separate types of two systems. It's obvious, you see, so it, it works quite well. Now then, the arteries are thicker than the veins. Why is that? Well, logically, because the arteries contain the vital spirits, which are extremely dynamic, and if they had just a thin vein holding them, it wouldn't hold them in. The vital spirits would fly out. That's obviously why the arteries are thick. Uh, not only that, but the arteries have the function of pulsing, where veins don't. And that, again, is part of Galen's system, because... Although the heart doesn't act as a pump, the arteries themselves pulsate, they expand and contract, and it's this movement of the arterial wall that makes the movement occur. And he knew this would uh, be logical because in the gut <coughs> there is peristaltic movement, sort of opening and contraction, and it moves material along the gut. So why not in the arteries? So, uh, in Galen's system, the heart, uh, <clears throat> the active phase is not contraction, it's dilatation. The arteries actually pulsate by themselves, and in pulsating, they open up, that is the pulse that you feel, boom, as the artery opens up and hits your finger, and that's attracting blood into it, into the artery, and moving it on. So that explains the heartbeat and the pulse. <clears throat> well, Galen thought that the blood flow was actually very slow, which is all you need, uh, but it is probably under pressure, and that's why when you cut an artery, it's spurted. It doesn't mean the flow is very fast, it just means it's under pressure. That's okay. Now, the tissues actually attract nutrient to them. Well, that kind of works into the system as well. 
So uh, it also explained how heat is produced and distributed in the body. So the heat is produced in the left ventricle, here, the vital spirits, of course, that's essential to life, and that the uh, arterial system distributes them. Well, Harvey's problem in kind of overcoming all this idea, which was all fairly logical, if he's going to suggest two types of blood, uh, but one system, uh, and blood is converted from bright red to dark red to bright red again, whereabouts is the conversion done? It wasn't obvious at all. Uh, and also, in Harvey's system, he had to provide a rapid blood flow, uh, because that was all part of the system which I will describe again. And in order to have a rapid blood flow, he would have to have very large communicating capillaries in the periphery and also in the lungs. So where were they? Well, the answer didn't come uh, until 1660 when uh, Malpighi described uh, the capillaries in the frog lung, and I'll talk about that a bit later. But it wasn't obvious to Harvey. Well, let me just give you the background to Harvey. Uh, so he was born in Folkestone in Kent. He went to King's Grammar School in, Gram in Canterbury. And uh, <clears throat> fortunately, there was a scholarship uh, that <clears throat> had been bequeathed to King's uh, Grammar School in Canterbury uh, to go to uh, Gondal and Keith's uh, College, Cambridge, uh, which he took. Um, the, um, and so then he did a BA. And uh, in that BA, he would have uh, followed the traditional uh, medieval uh, course, uh, which every uh, person going to law, the church, to medicine, had to follow the trivium. Uh, that's how we get the word tri uh, trivial things. Um, uh, so uh, rhetoric, um, ethics, and logic, and then a quadrivium, four things of music, uh, arithmetic, geometry and astronomy. Uh, so once he'd done that, he stayed on for a couple more years, and then he went and took himself off to Padua. By the way, this is uh, Gondal, this is Keith College, Cambridge, and down here is the, the Gate of Honour, if you've been to uh, Cambridge. Uh, that is kept closed, and the only people that go through the Gate of Honour are graduates that have graduated. Uh, so it's kept closed, and once you walk through the Gate of Honour, you've graduated. Still a very heavily medical college uh, piece. So this is his Padua Diploma, uh, which is held in the um, uh, Royal College of Surgeons of London. Uh, so he then came back to London, went into practice. He uh, had a, uh, a job at uh, St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London, private practice. He was, became a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. Uh, then he became a royal physician, first of all to James I, and then Charles I, his son. Um, and uh, then in 1628, he wrote his book, De Moto Cordis, which I'm going to be talking about, The Movement of the Blood. And then later on, he wrote another book uh, called De Generatione uh, Animalium, uh, which I will talk about as well. Now, what's the background to all this? Well, <clears throat> between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, there was a big shift in anatomy. Uh, on the left, we've got a uh, picture from a textbook by uh, de Keithon, uh, who uh, taught anatomy in Bologna, in northern Italy, uh, called Fasciculo de Medicina. Uh, and here the professor is uh, reading from a text, which would be Gale. Uh, and then a, an assistant, a very low-level assistant, is opening the body and pointing out the various parts to the audience, but there was no sense in which the uh, professor dirtied his, or his hands. Well, that all changed with the Renaissance and this man, Andreas Vesalius, um, who in 1543, the same year that uh, Copernicus published De, or the, the revolution of the uh, Earth around the Sun, um, he wrote this book called De Romani Corporis Fabrica, uh, using uh, exquisite drawings and dissections that he, had, that he had done himself. So Vesalius was a professor of uh, anatomy at the University of Padua. This is where, ha where Harvey went. So Padua is up here and it's the University City of Venice uh, and <clears throat> very closely linked with Venice. It was a, a kind of a mecca for um, particularly Protestant uh, students from Germany and England, 
uh, because while the rest of Italy was uh, completely subservient to the Pope and the Catholic Church, uh, Venice uh, thumbed their noses at the Pope and they were fiercely independent, the Venetians. They were into business, trade, and nothing inter would interfere with trade and business. Uh, and so they maintained their independence. Not only that, but uh, they maintained their independence of thought from the ideas of the Catholic Church and the jurisprudence of the Catholic Church. And so the University of Padua was very free-thinking, very free-thinking. And so Protestants from Germany and, um, and uh, England and elsewhere all flocked to Padua. And it was a great hive of activity. So this is where um, Vesalius was a, a professor and this is where most uh, ambitious young people went, including Harvey. And here's a drawing uh, showing the uh, gymnasium, which is basically the uh, the, inter, the part of the um, university where medicine was taught. Here's the anatomical theatre. Uh, <clears throat> and the reason I put it up is that it's got the names, uh, the cognomens, the location, the st stipend, the fee, and the uh, hours of the professor's um, presentations. This would, the students would read this, and this is for the year of 1661. This is where uh, when Harvey was here. Uh, and so the reason I've blown this up is that if we look down here in the early uh, or the late afternoon, here in the third hour of the afternoon, uh, we've got Hieronymus Fabricius. Now Fabricius is going to be uh, Harvey's teacher of anatomy and he's a very important character. Uh, so he is a professor of anatomy and surgery and his fee is a thousand gold florins a year. That's what he... Um, they had a system in the universities which I hope they've never introduced into New Zealand but um, basically uh, if the students didn't stump up and pay the fee then you were out the door so if you were no good uh, you didn't, get, didn't make any money and you got the boot so terrible system dear me um, but now if we then look over here this is the evening session for the Spiritinus and so if we look in the evening system uh, evening uh, session you could go and listen to Galileo Galilei who was professor of mathematics at the same time uh, and almost certainly Harvey uh, had met Galileo and the reason is that Fabricius who was his teacher was a very close friend of Galileo and um, Fabricius and Harvey were very close as we will see um, and uh, almost certainly he met Galileo uh, who of course had very important ideas on mechanics and measurement and flow and hydraulics, all these things. Uh, the other person I want to point out is just above here is Cesar Cremoninus. Uh, Cremoninus was the professor of philosophy and he was a, an Aristotelian philosopher. Uh, and so um, I'm going to suggest that Harvey was influenced by that as well. And the reason for that is that he was Cremoninus was also a close friend of Fabricius and Fabricius was very Aristotelian in his approach. By the way, when you, you can go to Venice and uh, in the wall of this uh, citadel which is called Ubo, uh, Harvey's plaque is on the wall. He was the English representative uh, there. Here is William Harvey and uh, Anglicus. Okay, so that's that. Now, here is Fabricius. Um, so, some of you who have done anatomy will know about the bursa of Fabricius, it's the same person. So, he was the professor of anatomy, and in fact, he was the third professor of anatomy after Vesalius. So, there was Vesalius who taught Fallopio, he of the Fallopian tubes fame, uh, and then uh, he taught Fabricius, and Fabricius taught Harvey. That is the way it went in Padua. It was absolutely a mecca of, of learning. Now, Fabricius made his name, uh, among other things, by writing this book called uh, De Venarum Osteolus, which means the kind of little trapdoors on the uh, veins. And uh, essentially, he identified the, vein, the, the valves in veins. Now, in veins, there are little valves that allow blood only to go in the forward direction and not go backwards. 
Now, uh, <coughs> um, Fabricius is the first one to describe these. And uh, he said their function <coughs> was to prevent blood pooling in the legs. That was, that's what he says in De Venarum Osteolus. Harvey, somewhat awkwardly, I suppose, pointed out that the veins in the neck and they <laughs> face downwards, which sort of mucks that system up a bit. <laughs> so it stops the blood from sort of pooling in your head as you're standing upright. Anyway, um, so now this is a drawing from that book, and just remember it because you'll see it again in a moment. Now the other thing that's important to my story is that uh, Fabricius is also interested in uh, embryology, and he wrote this little book here called De Formato Fetum, on the formation of a fetus, and Harvey also was interested in formation of a fetus and wrote a book, again influenced by Fabricius, I think. So when Harvey went back to uh, London, he became a member of the uh, Royal College of Physicians. Uh, he got himself a job at uh, St. Bartholomew's as a, an attending physician in private practice, but he was an ardent royalist, a very important uh, part of the story. Uh, and he became a royal physician, first of all to James, and then to Charles, who was James' son, his Charles. And so this is the dedication to his famous book, to Harvey's famous book, De Motor Cordis, and it reads, if I put my glasses on, Most Serene King, the animal's heart is the basis of its life and its chief member, the sun of its microcosm, on the heart of all it depends, all its activity depends, from the heart all its liveliness and strength arises, equally as the king is the basis of his kingdom, the sun and his microcosm, the heart of the state, and from him all power and arises and all grace stems. That is a translation, uh, my translation, from the uh, Latin of the um, introduction, or the dedication to Demotor Cordus. I want to draw your attention to this word microcosm, because that's going to come up again. Uh, one of the philosophical ideas that Harvey had, and he got from other people, was that the body is a microcosm, a little miniature version of the macrocosm. That's an Aristotelian idea, which we'll see in a minute. Okay, well, <clears throat> you will have heard of the English Civil War, which went from 1642 to 1646. Harvey, of course, was a, was a, uh, a great supporter of the, of the king, uh, and so the king uh, moved to Oxford, uh, and set up his court in the University of Oxford, took it over, uh, and gathered around him a, a group of um, loyal people. But before that happened, the very first uh, battle of uh, the Civil War was the Battle of Edge Hill in 1642. Uh, and this is uh, quite a well-known painting of Harvey. And um, I'm going to read you a, uh, a thing uh, that was written by uh, a, man, a man called uh, Aubrey, uh, who was a sort of a gossip columnist, if you will, uh, in the uh, Renaissance period, or in this period, uh, uh, Aubrey, Rock Aubrey, uh, and he knew everyone uh, that was anyone, and he wrote uh, a lot, uh, a very interesting stuff. And so he said, when the King Charles, by reason of the tumults, left London, Harvey attended him, and was at the fight at Edge Hill with him, and during the fight, the Prince of Wales and the Duke of York, as these two boys here, the, son, the sons of Charles the I, uh, were committed to his care. He told me that he withdrew with them under a hedge and took out of his pocket a book and read. And he had not read very long before a bullet of a great gun grazed the ground near them, which made him remove his station. <laughs> not unreasonably. So here's Harvey with his book. He's actually got two books here. Now these two boys, uh, the Duke of York, uh, it's this one here, and um, the Prince of Wales. He became Charles the Second on when Charles the First was beheaded, and this was his brother who became James the Second. Now, this painting's got uh, some rather allegorical significance. Harvey's sitting on a on a felled oak, and the boys are kneeling on the stump of an oak, which might reflect the block on which uh, Charles the First lost his head. Uh, I hope you don't think this is all too fanciful, but I think it's right. Uh, so in this tree here, there's a cut-off limb, which I take to be Charles I being beheaded. Uh, then there is a very vigorous limb, which is his successor, Charles II, the great King Charles, or good King Charles. And then there's a weak limb, which is this one. And this weak limb was James II, uh, who, of course, abdicated in 1688 uh, in favour of William and Mary. 
Well, anyway, uh, so in Oxford, um, Harvey uh, set up basically um, a physiological interest group of very like-minded uh, people and people that uh, did a lot of experimental work in respiratory and uh, cardiovascular physiology worked with him in Oxford and he became the warden of Merton uh, and then after 1646 he went back to London. Well, prior to that he had written this book and here is his famous book written in 1628 and the... <clears throat> entire name of it is Exercitatio Anatomica de Motor Cordis et Sanguinis in Animalibus, which means anatomical exercise. Now, each of these parts are quite important. It's an anatomical exercise, uh, and it's on the movement of the heart and the blood, the heart and the blood in animals, not just in humans. It's in animals. That's important as well. Um, and it was also written in the form of an exercise, an anatomical exercise, along again within the uh, Aristotelian tradition of the way in which a, uh, a topic was uh, presented by a student in a university and they had to be defended by the student an Aristotelian debate and that's the way in which the book is laid out so the first seven chapters are a preview of previous theories as I've just uh, given you uh, then in chapter 8 uh, he says idea, the, the ideas presented here are so new and unheard of that not only I fear mischief uh, which may arrive to me from the envy of some persons, so much does custom and, and doctrine once received and deeply rooted prevail with everyone. He knew that it was not going to be well received. And the book was written in 1628, and I've just uh, turned this off uh, back. There we go. Um, <clears throat> uh, but in fact, the work was probably written uh, 10 years earlier than that. And the reason internally is that in this book he describes uh, Fabricius as a grand old man, but Fabricius had died in 1619. So we know that the book, or the, most of the book, was written before that time. Anyway, in the uh, chapter 8 and 9, he writes about the circulation and volume experiments, which I'll show you, and then gives you supporting uh, experiments. Incidentally, the book was published in Frankfurt by this man who was an Englishman, uh, Gilbert Fitzer and he was an expatriate uh, and so there's been a lot of debate as to why it was published in, in, in Frankfurt, not in Leiden or in Britain and there are various theories about that. Okay, well here is the famous flow rate experiment and <clears throat> before we go to the left side, look at the right side and I'm going to be talking about cardiac output, CO. So the cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped uh, by each side of the heart in one minute. So, uh, and the cardiac output is the heart rate, that is the rate at which the heart beats, times the stroke volume, that is the volume that's expelled with each stroke. And the stroke volume here is the amount in each contraction in each ventricle. Now, I've written everything up in the way that Harvey wrote it up, although it's in Latin, uh, but he is using these terms. If the heart beats 70 times a minute, and the heart, meaning the left ventricle, holds two ounces, which is an ounce is about um, 30 cc's, maybe 50 cc's or so, then in one minute the heart must process 140 ounces or roughly 9 pounds of blood. In one hour it must uh, process 540 pounds of blood. In one day it must process 6.4 tons of blood, which is impossible. So if you may turn that into uh, modern terminology, uh, Harvey's saying that uh, <coughs> the heart uh, would produce 6,000 litres of blood each day. So it can't possibly just go out and be used up in the periphery, it must circulate. Well, where did he get the idea from? Well, this the volume experiment is the best known one, one that I've just described. But Robert Boyle, who was uh, uh, one of his associates at Oxford, and of course very famous for his uh, volume experiments, but Boyle also did experiments on respiratory physiology, uh, uh, particularly with uh, Thomas Willis. And so Boyle stated, uh, I remember when I first asked our famous uh, Harvey, in the only discourse I had with him, which was but a while before he died, what were the things that induced him to think of the circulation of the blood? He asked me that when he took notice that the valves and the veins of so many several parts of the body were so placed that they gave free passage of the blood toward the heart, 
but opposed the passage of the Vienna Blood away. So uh, he told Boyle that really what put him onto it were these valves and the movement of the valves. Well, how does it work? Well, this is the, these are the pictures that came out of Demotic Quarters. Uh, and the idea of um, putting a tourniquet around the arm to blow the arm up was well known to every physician, and that's why Harvey used this example uh, of the arm, because uh, bloodletting was universal. So he points out, I'm just going to focus on this picture and this picture here. Uh, so he points out that when you put a tourniquet around the arm and tighten it only just tight enough to block off the uh, flow of blood in the veins but not the artery, uh, then <clears throat> these valves blow up. And these valves are little swellings of the vein which have got this kind of structure here like that. And then he said, okay, if you put your finger right here, that is toward the hand, and then take your other finger and stroke it up the vein toward the head, and then take your finger off, well then the blood won't go back down to the original finger because the veins, the valves will stop it. And you could then do another experiment down here where if you put your finger, keep this finger here, put another finger here, and stroke the blood down that away to try and make it go past the vein, it still won't go. It'll just blow up. So he pointed out that uh, these valves were unidirectional and the blood could only flow in one way. And I just wanted to point out that is the drawing from Fabricius's book, you see, and so it's not a million miles away from the drawing that Harvey's used. They are, I think they discussed it. Well, then he uh, described some supporting experiments in chapter 9 of his book. And um, the first question he attempted to answer was this one. Um, when you have a cadaver, a dead body, uh, and you open the arteries, uh, where is all the blood? Why is there no blood there? Well, Harvey explained that by saying that <clears throat> in death, the lungs collapse. And they do. Uh, and so the blood uh, could not go into the left side of the, uh, the heart, but the blood was in the arterial system, kept pumping, although the, the, the lungs had collapsed, the left ventricle kept pumping, and all the blood was pushed into the venous system. So then he had the experiment of tying off the vena cava, rather two vena cava, he tied them both off, I've only got one drawing here. So there was no blood going in here, and he found that the lungs became empty when he dissected the dog uh, that he was working with. Uh, not only that, but the arteries were empty as well, but the veins were full, and therefore that proved to him, at least, that the circulation was going through this way and had been blocked by his ligature. And then finally, the question of where, what about these holes in the interventricular septum came up. So he took a, an ox bladder and a tube and sealed off the exits of the right side of the heart, put the catheter into the right ventricle, which is this, and pumped the water hard, and nothing at all came through into the left ventricle, as you would expect, because there are no holes there. Well, then he uh, looked at the motion of the heart. So when you look at, uh, <clears throat> if you open a chest in a living animal, uh, the heart is uh, moving very rapidly. And it moves up and down. It rises and it shortens and it, it sinks and lengthens, number one and number two. So it was previously thought that the uh, rising and shortening of the heart that you could see in an animal was due to relaxation of the heart and filling well, Harvey demonstrated that it was quite wrong. It was the other way around, that, in fact, the rising and shortening was contraction and diminished volume and expulsion of blood in the left ventricle. And in support of that, he pointed out that when you put your finger on the heart, as it was rising and shortening, it felt harder. So the muscle was contracting, not only that, it was quite, or quite er, as it was contracting and the blood was uh, put out. Finally... He pierced the left ventricle and demonstrated that the blood shot out when the heart rose and shortened. Well, uh, the further experiments that he describes in his book are on cold-blooded animals. So he did a lot of experiments on fish uh, and eels and snakes 
and uh, as well as dogs, but he pre preferred smaller animals, partly because they were simpler, and when they were cold-blooded, they tended to have a slower heart rate. So here is an experiment that he did on a fish, <clears throat> and he put a tire around the atrium, the sinus venosus, which is the opening of the atrium, and demonstrated that uh, the rest of the heart, the atrium, uh, the oracle, and the uh, ventricle empty and don't refill in a, heart, in a fish of a heart. Now, as the heart dies, it slows down, and so it's easier to decide at what point the atria contract and the ventricles contract, because in the living animal, they're going so fast, it's pretty hard to tell which is which. But in the dying animal, it all slows down, and eventually the ventricle stops contracting completely and you're left, left with the atria. So uh, he then appears the dying atrium and demonstrated that blood was expelled. This is all described in Demetric Quartus. So the Galenists were wrong. Uh, and then finally he described a fairly logical experiment where he took a dog, tied off the outlet to the heart uh, as the heart kept pumping in the live animal then opened the artery beyond the tie and there was no blood there uh, but the vein coming into the heart was uh, distended. Well the next problem he had to deal with were the heart valves. Now there are four main valves that we're going to be concerned with uh, but Galen had said that the mitral valve is incompetent. Now the uh, valves I'm talking about are on the right side of the heart, the pulmonary valve, which is at the root of the pulmonary artery, and the tricuspid valve, which is between the right atrium and right ventricle, the aortic valve, which is at the root of the aorta, and the mitral valve, which is between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Now, <clears throat> the mitral valve is so called because it looks like a bishop's mitre. Mitros is the Greek word for a mitre. So it's got two valves on it, see? whereas all the others have got three valves. So Galen said, OK, well, it's got three valves because it doesn't work properly. As it closes, it leaks some fluid going backwards. It's, as we say, incompetent. The others are tight. The mitral valve is incompetent. And why does it do it? Well, Galen says the reason is that it has to allow not only air to come in from the lung, but waste toxic material from the left ventricle to get be got rid of backwards in the lungs. So the pulmonary veins have this function, a two-way function. Uh, air and fluid goes backwards and forwards in a seesaw kind of fashion. That's why the mitral valve is incompetent. It's not incompetent, by the way, but Galen said it was. So Harvey said, well, nature doesn't do anything in vain. That's, this is all in De Voto Cordis. This is an Aristotelian philosophical idea. Why should one valve be incompetent and not the others? Well, Galen had an answer for that, not a very convincing one. Then Harvey said, well, why is the pulmonary artery, this one here, the same size as the aorta? Uh, if it's only, the function of the pulmonary artery is only to carry nutrient to the lung, that's not logical. Uh, they should have the same function, more or less, they're carrying the same volume of blood, and they are. Why is the left ventricle the same size as the right ventricle? And they are. Uh, well, they're the same size because they've got the same function, or at least they carry the same volume of blood. So uh, this was all against um, Galen. Now here's John Aubrey again. He was a great gossip. He was a very interesting man to read, John Aubrey, uh, because he, as I said, he was more or less a columnist. Uh, he was a, a scientist. In fact, he was at Oxford with Harvey uh, and all the other uh, people in the, in the King's, in Charles the uh, First Circle. Um, and uh, he was a scientist, but he, he wrote interesting anecdotes about everyone. He knew everyone. A bit of a gossip, really, but he was a really a, a, like a newspaper columnist. So he said, I heard him say that after his book of the circulation of the blood came out, that he fell mightily in his practice, and it was believed that by the vulgar that he was cracked brand. And all the physicians were against his opinion and envied him, and many wrote against him. And with much ado at last, in about 20 or 30 years' time, it was received by all the universities in the world. Well, once it was published, there was an immediate outcry. And leading the pack of uh, opponents was this man, James Primrose. And James Primrose, I'm just going to focus on because uh, uh, there were many uh, people who wrote against Harvey, but Primrose was uh, the leader, really. <clears throat> Primrose was a Galenist. 
he believed that Galen was God. Galen could not possibly be wrong. And he had a theory of the circulation called the ebullition theory. Now it's very similar to what happens in a cafe with latte coffee or milk. So the idea uh, of Primrose was that in the left ventricle a small amount of blood is heated. And Harvey believed that the, the, the left ventricle heated as well uh, to provide body heat. But the blood frothed up and so the volume from a very small amount of blood, just a few drops, was very, very large, or potentially very, very large, you see. This explained uh, the discrepancy in Harvey's work. Well, uh, Harvey uh, combated that by taking uh, a vial or a flask of arterial blood and, and uh, venous blood and letting them settle, and he demonstrated that the volume that you ended up with was exactly the same after you left them there for about half an hour. They all settled and cooled. Not only that, but after about an hour, they ended up the same colour because the arterial blood lost its oxygen. So that put the kibosh, well, apparently, on Primrose's idea. Well, then Primrose said, well, what's the difference between a live and a dead heart? You're dealing with dead hearts. How come uh, a live heart just do, maybe it looks different? Uh, and then what about the fact that you're postulating that the left ventricle contracts, it's actually pushing against a column of blood, like pushing against a wall. Well, Harvey had to counter out these, these, um, these arguments. Well, uh, Primrose wrote his book, uh, which came out just three years later after Harvey, and here it is called Exitazione uh, de et Anima Versiones in Librum uh, Guilliarmi Havei. De motor cordis circulatione sanguinis. Uh, so here's a page from his book, and one of the things that he pointed out was an experiment that Galen had done. And Galen took an artery, now this is an artery here, and Galen was trying to prove that the uh, arterial pulse is transmitted along the wall of the artery. See, but the artery pulsates by itself. And so what Galen did was he cut a piece of the artery out in a living animal, put a tube into each end and tied them off. And he, then he demonstrated that the arterial pulse didn't continue beyond the tube to the other end. Uh, so that seemed to convince Galen that uh, you know, the uh, arterial pulse was actually transmitted all the way along the wall. Uh, there are various reasons why that uh, experiment should have worked, partly because it's very difficult to reproduce in a, in a living animal that, that's struggling, but uh, it seemed to um, satisfy again. Well, these two men, Fortunatus Plimp and Henry Roy, uh, did another experiment to disprove that. What they did was open up an artery in a living animal and put a sponge in uh, without damaging the wall and then closed up the wall and they demonstrated that the uh, pulse stopped here and didn't go on because the sponge had uh, blocked the blood flow but had damaged the arterial wall. Well, our friend James Primrose got his pen out and wrote two fiery uh, books uh, in, to each of the, against each of them. And here, one of them against uh, Fortunatus Plimp is called uh, Destructio Fundamentorum Vopisci Funati Plimp. Now, Vopisci is, is a, it's a, it's a very obscure Latin word which means when there are twins and one twin is born and dies and then the other twin is born, that's a Vopisci. So it's a very unusual and complicated metaphor that you'll have to think about what was Primrose trying to say about this experiment. Anyway, then he wrote another book called Antidotum ad Versus Spongiosum Venatum of Henry Roy, Henry Reggie. Uh, <clears throat> well then, in Holland, uh, Johannes Wallaeus, who was a very well-respected uh, physiologist uh, teaching at the University of Leiden, uh, came to Harvey's support. Uh, he examined living animals. Unfortunately, this is vivisection, which is really quite horrendous, I have to say. Took a living animal cut the tip off the ventricle and demonstrated that blood spurted out, which Harvey hadn't uh, quite done. Uh, he then tied off the artery, the femoral artery of a living dog, and demonstrated before it uh, was tied off that it spurted, after it um, was tied off it did not spurt, and that uh, blood did not flow in the veins. And he calculated that the blood circulated, at 15 minute, 15, uh, circulated in 15 minutes. 
And our friend Primrose got his pen out again. He, he wrote off these fiery epistles to uh, books about everyone that disagreed with him. And so here, uh, Anna Bidversiones in J. Walia Disputatio Dem, 1639. Well, what was the nature of Harvey's discovery? Uh, in the Renaissance, the Renaissance means rebirth, and the rebirth was the rebirth of the ancient wisdom of Galen, particularly, and Aristotle, and Plato later on. Uh, now, one of the things about Aristotle and his approach to science was that he looked at qualities, not quantities. Uh, that was the essence of Aristotelian uh, science. Uh, you looked at the qualities of hot, cold, wet, dry, not 20 degrees, 40 degrees, 60 degrees. He wasn't interested in calculation, it was all in qualities. Whereas the scientific revolution, which came in from 1600 or so, uh, basically was a rejection of ancient authority and the use of mathematics. That, to my mind, is the essential difference between the two periods. Here is Galileo demonstrating his microscope to the Doge of Venice, uh, and that was the essence of the scientific revolution. Look for yourself. Don't look at someone else. Just take a look. That's the whole essence of it. Now, where did Harvey get this idea of the circulation from? Well, we've, we've had some suggestion that it came from the valves, and it may well, it probably did as well. But Harvey was an Aristotelian. And uh, I've already mentioned the title of his book, Exercitatio, Aristotelian Exercise, De Motor Cortis et Sanguinis in Alemalia. So he was studying animals, not humans really. Uh, and he was looking particularly at animals without lungs, uh, as did Aristotle. Now, Aristotle wrote a book called De Metrologia. He had read it in Greek, of course. Uh, and it basically said that the water cycle or water in the world is in a circle. That's basically what it says. And here's a little quote from uh, Aristotle's book. It's clear that if anyone should wish to make the calculation of the amount of water flowing in the day and picture the reservoir, he will see that it would have to be as great as the size of the earth to receive all the water flowing in a year. This is exactly the same idea that, that Harvey had. And I think this is maybe not where he got it from, but it certainly supported it. And then there's a block of text out of uh, Harvey's book, De Motu Cordis. Uh, and it's too small. I don't want to read it. I've got it small, so you don't read it. I'm going to read it here. And this is from Harvey's book. After the same manner that Aristotle says the rain and the air do imitate the motion of the superior bodies, the sun, moon, and the planets, for the earth being wet evaporates by the heat of the sun, and the vapours being raised aloft are condensed and descend in showers and wet the ground. So in all likelihood it comes to pass in the body that all the parts are nourished and cherished and quickened with blood, which is warm, perfect, vaporous, full of spirit, that I may say alimentative. In the parts of the blood are refrigerated, coagulated, and made as it were barren. From thence it returns to the heart uh, as to the fountain and dwelling house of the body, and so on. Uh, so I think he got this idea partly, at least, from our friend Cesar Cromonius, who was the professor of philosophy and an Aristotelian uh, in, in Padua. Well, this idea of the circularity of uh, the weather and, and um, the water cycle and the circulation of the blood uh, was an idea that was very common in the early 1600s, and it's called the theory of the macrocosm and the microcosm, the idea that the body the microcosm is a miniature of the universe and that everything in the body is basically a, a miniature version of what goes on in the universe. So like the earth around the sun, the blood goes around the heart. That's just one. Well, Harvey's <clears throat> great friend was this man called Robert Flood. Now, Robert Flood is a very interesting character if you want to read more about him. He was uh, a Rosicrucian, but he was an established uh, doctor uh, well regarded, a member, a fellow of the College of Physicians of London and a great friend of, of Robert Flood and he wrote the first book supporting Harvey in fact the year after it was after Harvey's book was produced and Robert Flood's book here is called Medicina Catholica uh, and you'll see the interesting thing is that the frontispiece here, or the title on the frontis page, is, is uses the same uh, logo as Harvey's book and in fact, it was printed in Frankfurt, not by the same printer, but I would imagine from the same printing house. 
So uh, there was a lot of crossover of these two people. Here is Flood on the left side. Now, Flood was uh, a very mystical in his approach. Uh, you'll remember that uh, Newton was very interested uh, in alchemy and mysticism. Well, Robert Flood was very similar in that he believed in this microcosm, macrocosm idea, and he was particularly interested in Harvey's idea that the blood was alive. Uh, Harvey had the idea that the blood was full of spirits. It went in a circle, but it was in some sense alive. So there was an al alchemical, alchemy overtone to this whole thing. You know, the deduction of li life in the blood and the idea of macrocosm and microcosm. And here's a book from, here's an entire page from one of Harvey's book, uh, Flood's books, I should say, where the human body is uh, related to macrocosm, microcosm, uh, the moving of the, the, the oceans and uh, the movement of the sun and so on. Well, two years later, uh, yet another book of a similar vein appeared in support of Harvey by this man called Philip Sachs. Uh, and <clears throat> you'll see that it's called Oceanus Macrocosmicus uh, Dissertatio Epistolica de Analogo Moto Aquarum ex et Oceanum Sanguinis ex et Ad Cor, meaning the analogy or the similarity of water going uh, out of and into the ocean uh, as with the blood going out of and into the heart. So he's using the same sort of analogy. And this is a drawing from his book uh, showing the circularity of uh, fluid. And we're going to see this logo again. And here he's got a picture of the human body, uh, Derivasia, that's the origin of the arterial system, and then Revulsio, the return of the blood. So he's talking about the return of the blood in the same way. Well, <clears throat> uh, just as an aside, but an important aside, I think, uh, Harvey, uh, later on in his life, uh, wrote this book called Executaciones de, Genera de Generazione Animalia, Exercises on the Generation of Animals. Uh, now, he, all his uh, scientific life, he'd been interested in dissecting small animals, and he was particularly interested in uh, embryology. And he uh, described the same experiments that, that Aristotle had described, looking at the chick, which is the easiest uh, embryological um, subject to look at. So you take a tray of the eggs that have been fertilized, and uh, take a dozen eggs, and you open each one of them uh, over each day for 12 days, and you've got a, you know, a textbook laid out in front of you of the way in which the heart develops. Um, and so he wrote this book. Not only that, but I mentioned that he was a great uh, <clears throat> uh, follower of the king, uh, and the king, uh, James, uh, Charles I, uh, allowed Harvey and encouraged Harvey to experiment on the deer in his uh, park. Uh, and Harvey not only did uh, experiments on the cardiovascular system, but also uh, embryological um, experiments. These are the ones that are written up in De Generatio Alamario. And I'll just go back to... Um, uh, my friend uh, Fabricius, because, of course, Fabricius had also written a book on the formation of the fetus. Uh, by the way, this is the name, Hieronymus Fabricius Abacopendente. That was his full name, but everyone knows him as Fabricius. Down at the bottom here, I've got the, the two big debates at the time in the early 1600s were between, in embryology, between epigenesis and preformation. Uh, <clears throat> preformation said that in the uh, ovum, or the egg, the adult is already there in miniature. It doesn't develop in any way. That's preformation theory. Epigenesis says that um, the um, material in the egg starts off as a very primitive thing and then proliferates and becomes more complex as it goes on. That was the big, big debate, but we won't get into that. Well, Harvey was vindicated, shall we say, <coughs> and the loop was closed in 1660 uh, when Mal uh, Marcello Malpighi, uh, a Dutchman, um, uh, an Italian working in Holland actually, in 1660 uh, discovered the capillaries in the frog lung. Uh, and he, he, he did it by using uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's microscope. And here's a picture of Leeuwenhoek's microscope. It's actually very, very small. So it's uh, just a little pinhole 
and in the pinhole there is a little round globule of glass uh, and then the thing you're looking at you put on the little pin there and you look through the little uh, globule of glass at the, at the thing but the magnification is quite spectacular he could get two or three hundred times magnification with this very small device and so Malpighi demonstrated the uh, capillaries of the lungs and so closed the circle well the first book, textbook uh, that used circulation theory, first anatomy textbook was uh, written by this man here called Nathaniel Highmore, 1651, another pupil of Harvey. Um, the anatomists will know that the old name, uh, rather puffy name I suppose for the maxillary sinus is the antrum of Highmore as he described it for the first time. Anyway, uh, here it's called Corpus Humani Disposition Anatomica in qua Sanguinis Circulationum, in which the circulation of the blood is described. And here is the title page. Uh, so, um, Excellentissimo et ornatissimo vira doctore Harveo. Namireris clarissime, Dr. Harvey. It's uh, no wonder, Dr. Harvey, that your illustrious name uh, appears at the opening of this book and so on. And I want to draw your attention to the drawing down here. This is the same drawing that you saw two slides back, so there was quite a lot of crossover of, of ideas. Well, what was Harvey's legacy? Well, um, the group of uh, young experimenters that he gathered around him in Oxford uh, while Charles I was in exile in the University of Oxford, uh, <clears throat> after the restoration of Charles II, uh, they all moved to London uh, and ultimately formed the Royal Society. And the individuals uh, involved were, among many others, there were 50 of them, Robert Boyle, uh, who did a lot of respiratory physiology experiments, his assistant, shall we say, Robert Hooke. Uh, Christopher Wren, who you know designed St. Paul's, but he was one of these extraordinary people that was absolutely brilliant at everything he did. You probably met people like that. <laughs> you know, he could do maths, he could do physics. In fact, he was a professor of astronomy in London, as well as popping out and designing some calls and uh, sort of designing this, that, and the other. And, and, and he also, uh, I see there's a neurologist in the audience, uh, Thomas Willis, uh, <coughs> uh, wrote a textbook, The Circle of Willis, uh, and uh, Christopher Wren did all the drawings for, uh, Thomas, for Thomas Willis' book. So here's Thomas Willis down here, and Richard Lower, who uh, described the um, contraction of the heart. There's the history of the Royal Society, written by Thomas Spratt. <coughs> Well, um, this is the, the final statement that Harvey makes in his book, and here's the translation of the Latin. It must necessarily be concluded that the blood is driven around in a circular motion in living creatures and that it moves perpetually, and this is the function of the heart, which by pulsation it performs, and lastly, that the motion and pulsion of the blood of the heart is the only cause. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Okay. Yeah. So Good. between Galen and Harvey, did yes. none of the uh, Islamic researchers run about the 8th, 9th, 10th? Yeah, they did. And you are about to, to raise the question of Ibn al uh, in I think. Okay, well, the Islamic researchers actually did make some progress in uh, anatomy. And there was a slide, I'm not sure if I've actually got it down here. Um, I wasn't going to talk about this because it's kind of complicated. Uh, I've taken it off. Oh, no, I haven't. There it is here. Okay, now, um, uh, <coughs> people had suggested, in fact, that there was a pulmonary circulation. Now, no one had quite worked it out. The the um, person who, before Harvey described it, was this man called Rialdo Colombo. He was professor of anatomy and surgery in uh, University of Pisa. Um, but it had also been uh, described by this uh, physician in Damascus, uh, an Islamic physician, Ibn al-Nafis, in 1250. But this, his work only came to light in the early 1900s. And so it is true that the Islamic physicians did some work in this, and Ibn al-Nafis probably 
um, understood the pulmonary circulation, but not at the time of Harvey. No? Um, so I come to this from like a mindset of having studied the normal, regular circulation over the last couple of yeah. years. Um, and so, like, learning, trying to get wrap my head around Galen's um, ideas was pretty hard because I had to rewrite that. Yes. So, do you think that um, Galen's, um, like, circulation kind of makes more sense at first principles? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, because Harvey, uh, how did Harvey get the blood from the arterial to the venous system? Well, Harvey suggested that basically the arterial blood squishes into the tissue like a sponge and kind of just oozes all the way through the tissues and then it kind of oozes like squishing a sponge into the veins. That's, that's the way Harvey explained it because he couldn't see these capillary communications. So, you know, Galen's system was quite logical and as I've said, it convinced and satisfied highly experienced and highly a trained and experienced medical people. You know, it seemed quite logical to them. So, it was a leap. Another one? Anyone else? Well, thanks for your attention. Well done, thank you.